Hi, good evening. Um, Gemma here. Um, first of all, an apology to all and sundry for the fact that I have kind of been missing in action for about two weeks or thereabouts. Um, I have been in the middle of moving house. Um, there's stuff strewn everywhere. Um, it's not a pleasant sight to see. Uh, I had kind of hoped that I would start doing the videos again once we'd settled down um and but that's not happened and it's been too long so um on a few days ago uh, while we we're traveling my wife asked me a question um and i don't remember the question verbatim but fundamentally it was about who will make the rapture and how can you have confidence about making rapture and my answer was found in two things, which I want to share with you just now. And those two things are, number one, you have been redeemed. In fact, the third thing just popped into my head now. Number one, you have been redeemed. Number two, you are his bride. And number three, God keeps his promises. Number one, you are redeemed. Number two, you are his bride. And number three, God keeps his promises. Um, the Bible makes us understand in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. I'll read it very quickly. Hopefully I don't slam this uh, video shot. Um, so Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 from verse, uh, so from verse 3 of Ephesians 1, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm reading from the New King James translation. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7, in whom or in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Let me read that again. In verse 7 of Ephesians 1, it says, in him or in whom, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now, that word redemption there, um, a lot of the time people think of it as a synonym for salvation, but they are two completely different things. They result in the same thing, salvation, but they are two completely different things. Salvation talks about rescue. The word redemption talks about buying something. Buying something, okay? So it says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Verse 13, in him you also trusted, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed. The word seal there is a word to mean marked. You were marked out. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption or until the collection of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory, until the redemption of the purchased possession. Remember I mentioned that the word redemption talks about buying something. You have been bought with a price. If you look at the book of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, around verse 18. Um, I believe it's verse 18. It says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. In other words, perishable items. You're not redeemed with perishable items like silver or gold 
from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. So there you see it again. It's talking about redemption in the context of buying something. But here it's saying you are not bought with gold, you are not bought with silver, you are not bought with dollars or pounds or with naira or rupees or CDs. You are bought, you are not bought with blockchain currencies, Ethereum and so on. You are bought with, in verse 19 it says, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish. And without spot, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So number one, you have been bought. You have been purchased. Um, an illustration comes to mind. Imagine you're going to buy a car, especially in the Western world. This would be pretty commonplace. When you go to buy a car or even a house, you typically will drop a deposit. And typically, most of the time anyway, the deposit is not the same value as the, the item that you're purchasing. But the idea of the deposit is that it gives an indication of commitment to redeem or to collect the item for which you are dropping the deposit. Now, what then happens is you have... you 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 you. you you give over the deposit to whoever the merchant is that's selling you the item, whether it's a car, a house, whatever it is, the vendor, you, you give the vendor some money um, as a deposit to, to show your seriousness in purchasing the item. And on an agreed date or after an agreed period of time, you then go back and collect this item that you have agreed to purchase. Now, more often than not, in human terms, when we carry out these sorts of transactions, we tend to leave a fraction of the amount of money with the vendor, whoever is selling the product. But in our case, when Jesus paid the price on the cross, he gave everything that was required. He gave his life to purchase yours. He gave his life to purchase yours and mine. He gave the entire price. So the only thing that is left is for him to come and collect. That's reason number one for making the rapture. Reason number two, you are a bride. Now, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might wash her through the sanctifying of the word, sorry, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own, hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Look at verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The bride, we, you and I are the bride. Now, if you look at the Jewish, the Jewish tradition of marriage, um, and you remember that Jesus, when he walked the face of the earth, was a Jew. Most of the writers of the, of the scriptures, and as far as I recall, all of the writers of, of, of the documented Bible that we have today were Jews. I could be wrong about that, but I think they were all Jews. Anyway, um, that's not an issue here. The, the point of the matter is that it, in the context of the Jewish tradition of marriage, um, the man would typically get involved in a marriage contract or a betrothal or an engagement ceremony, at which point he shows his commitment to take the bride unto himself. When that commitment is made, it's just a legal commitment. There is no, um, there is no consummation of the marriage. There is no um, intercourse of any kind after that event until the, fa the no, sorry, there is no consummation of the marriage. What then happens is after the betrothal, the man goes back to his father's house to prepare room in his father's house for his bride. When the room is ready, when the room is ready, or when the house is ready, or when the mansion is ready, whatever the size of the house is, 
The father says to the son, go get your bride. And then the son comes, usually with an announcement, all of a sudden, by surprise. Not usually expected at some point. I mean, there's an expectation that he will return. The only difference is, even though there's an expectation that he will, he will return, there is no knowledge of when precisely he will return. But when he returns, he returns suddenly with plenty of noise and rejoicing. Okay, and usually the expectation is that the wife or the bride, I should say, the bride will have kept herself chaste up until this point. And then when the, when the bridegroom gets his bride, then there is a, um, a celebration and rejoicing. And then there's a consummation of the marriage and so on. Now look at what the Bible says in John chapter 14. John chapter 14 in verse 1, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, do not be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many mansions. In my father's house, there are many rooms. I'll read it for you. It says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. So that's the second reason why we know that he will come for you and I. Number one, because you have been redeemed and bought by his own blood. And number two, because you have become his bride. You have a contract. You have a marriage contract. You effectively have two contracts in one, one in which you have been bought and the other in which you have become engaged. Okay, but here's the thing. So the question then is, why should we believe this? The Bible makes us understand in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, Paul said something. He said, for all the promises of God in Christ Jesus are yea and amen. It says none of his promises are yea and nay. There is no, there is no, there is no um, going and coming with God. God is consistent. Look at what the Bible says in James chapter 1 verse 17. It says every good and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is neither variableness nor shadow of turning. God doesn't change. He doesn't change his mind. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8, he says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. Now here's the thing. If Jesus Christ could keep his promise with regard to coming the first time, of which the Bible speaks less about than his coming the second time, is it the second time that he's going to speak less of? Think about that. But just on the, on the complete aside, in terms of confidence of making the rapture, Consider this, all the things I have mentioned now so far about you, about the, the reason why you'll make the rapture and why um, you should have confidence about the rapture. Remember, I, I first mentioned that he has redeemed you or he has bought you. So you are his possession and he's coming back for you. Number two, he has become engaged to you. There is a marriage in view. You are currently engaged to him. You are his fiance, so to speak. And then, and, and there will be a marriage ceremony. So one day he's going to come and take you to himself. And number three, the fact that he always keeps his promises. Now, one of the things, or the fundamental thing you may have noticed by now, the recurring theme you may have noticed by now, and I, I will start drawing to a close, is that none of these three things are dependent on you. All these three things, all the work, is done by him redeeming you the blood was shed by him becoming your bridegroom it was him that proposed to you the bride it was him the Bible tells us he cleansed you through the washing of water by the word he made you his bride number three all the promises of God are yea and amen it doesn't say all the promises of God are yea when you behave in a certain way it says, all the promises of God are yea and amen. So your, your, your confidence of making the rapture, whether it happens tonight, tomorrow, next week, is all premised on one thing. And I'll read it to you. Romans chapter 10. And this is actually very simple. In, in, some, in, in many schools of thought, it's called the ABCs of salvation, which is 
Acknowledge the fact. Acknowledge you are being a sinner if you are not yet saved. Acknowledge you are a sinner. Admit it. Come to terms with it. Believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. And confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you'll be saved. Let's read it together. It's in Romans chapter 10, about verse 9 or thereabouts. It says, um, it says in Romans 10, verse 9, um, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord overall is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord, because whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay? Now, I'll conclude by saying this. He redeemed you, he made you his bride, and he made you a promise. That's why you'll be there on that day. So the question is, and I, I can hear some people already saying, oh, that means you're saying that anybody can do anything and still go to heaven. You can lie, steal, kill, fornicate, do all sorts of horrible things and still go to heaven. Um, actually, I think if you did all those things, you'd be saying directly that you are not actually saved. Why? Because 1 John chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 tells us that the one who is the son of God, the one who is the child of God, the seed of God abides in him and he does not continue to sin. The seed of God. The seed of God abides in him and he does not continue to sin. Why? Because when a person gets saved, God places in him his spirit. God places in that person his nature, which causes a conflict with the human sinful nature. That person is no longer comfortable with sin. If you find a believer who is comfortable with sin, then ask him if he's really a believer. Why? Well, Jesus kind of alluded to this when he said, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord. Have we not done such and such in your name? Have we not done such and such? And he will say to, to them, depart from me, I know you not. One translation says, he will say to them, get away from me, I never knew you. A person who is comfortable with sin cannot have the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God is at odds with sin. Friends, I'll stop here because this is already getting long. Again, I apologize for, not, for being away for so long. Hopefully, I'll do a bit more now. But just rest assured. Number one, he is coming very soon. Number two, the reason why you'll make it is because of what he has done. The three things he has done. Number one, he's redeemed you and bought you and is coming back to collect. Number two, he's engaged to you as your bridegroom and is coming back for his bride. And number three, he always keeps his promises. Remember that. God bless you. It's good to see you again. Bye.